Hey, Tony, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tony Knopf. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ticket Manager. Yeah, you have a unique background, you know, talking to you and, and reading up on, on, on what you've done. And, uh, you know, you, you quote yourself, and I want to make sure I get it right here, you know, technology geek that loves making things more transparent, efficient, and economical. That was you, right? Um, how, how and from where did all this evolve for you? You know, it's, uh, I'd like to take credit for it, but I can't. Um, I was very lucky to be born where I was. You know, when I walk into a room, people don't see me as a coder or as a tech geek or as a numbers guy. I mean, I'm 6'7", 230 pounds, and I play volleyball for the under-20 Olympic team, right? I, I don't fit the mold of what people think. <laughs> but uh, I was lucky enough to be born in Cupertino. Uh, my father worked at HP for years, and then uh, he was at Apple under Steve Jobs in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, and then went up with a small startup when he joined it called Cisco Systems. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah, we had um, we just had the luck of being in a situation where that's that's what we were exposed to at an early age. Um, we, as freshmen in high school, had computer courses on how to write HTML code. Uh, uh, interesting story, uh, Al Gore, when he invented the Internet, uh, <laughs> he was at my high school when he did that. I was standing 500 feet away from him. Uh, as my high school was the first public internet uh, lab that had been opened anywhere globally. So you're and a co-founder so, of the internet. I know, I found it. I, me and Al, we, we were, we're tight. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it's just interesting that, you know, we were given those things. And it wasn't, we didn't have the same uh, stereotypes that went along with that. You know, the nerdism that maybe went along in, in other places. So for us, it wasn't uncool to be good at math. It wasn't uncool to be good at writing things on the code. It wasn't, you know, we thought binarily at a young age. And it's really driven us to, it's really driven me into a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I like that. Um, we had an interesting discussion also where I agreed that you're not really in the ticket business, which is the first thing people would think based on, on the name. But, oh, yeah. but you really support your clients with more, more effective marketing, um, positive PR, supply chain, sustainability, you know, all, of, all those that are absolutely critical to any, any business. Can you explain to our business audience you know, how this happens by the by the service that your company provides? Absolutely, absolutely. The best way we can describe it is we trade convenience for data. Now, the problem that we're fixing is basically, I'll, I'll take the 30,000 foot view and then we'll move from there. Starting in the late 90s, companies started to focus on automation, whether that was, and not the automation that we've seen historically, you know, industrial automation, supply chain automation, but CRM, ERP, you know, making it easier for our people to be successful using fewer resources. And what we look at is the natural evolution of that. As companies have gotten better at marketing automation, at sales automation, the next thing is asset automation. And that's what we are. You know, at any given company, you have country club memberships, you have Lakers tickets, you have you know invitations to your company table, you have a conference where you're taking customers to create this, this relationship to try to sell them your product. What we want to do is take all of those assets and automate them. We want to make them easier. And if you go to a company and you say, you have to use this system, it doesn't work. Right? People always push back. But if you can make their life more convenient, they'll do things you'd never believe. If I came to you and said, hey, Mark, I want to follow you everywhere you go. I want to know exactly who you talk to when. I want to be able to read all your emails. And I want to know what you had for breakfast this morning. Your answer would be, you're out of your mind. I would never agree to that. Google and Apple do that to us every day. Right. And it's because they've done such a terrific job of trading convenience for that data. It's so convenient for us. We say, okay, yeah, we're going to do this. And that's what our business does, right? Our business is saying, okay, you as a company have a concern around fraud, around automation, and around ROI. You have shareholders. You have people you have to justify your spend to. Well, we're coming and saying, look, we can check off all of those boxes while making it so convenient for your users that this won't be an issue for you. So that's what we do. We're, we're more asset automation and a marketing tool than anything else. Yeah, I think, I think it's brilliant because like, like we've also talked, um, I've seen so many tickets go wasted that yeah. um, the cost of op the opportunity cost, the real cost, the, the you know, um, it's, it's amazing. So uh, I think yeah. it's fantastic. And it, yeah. it's the two examples you've seen, right? There's, there's the one example, which is your drawer that's full of tickets at the end of the year, right? Our, our customer at CBS said I could I could wallpaper my office with New York Mets tickets at the end of the year. But the other one you see is when you show up to see you know the Lakers play the Celtics in the NBA Finals and there's a 16 year old boyfriend of the neighbor of your assistant's dog sitting in the seats, right? And and that's what we're looking to help companies with to say, look, it's not just non-use, it's underuse, and it's you know 
to fraudulent use, which we have plenty of stories about people breaking every rule you can imagine with sports tickets. Yeah, I, I bet. Um, you know, on the on the theme of sports, you've been in and around it. Obviously, um, sure. an executive of a actually a pro hockey team told me a while back. He said that um, they always aim every year to win the championship. They know they're not going to win it every year because it's super competitive, whatever league you're of in. Course. Um, but they but they aim for it now. What but what they do mandate and what they do demand every year is winning seasons. And some of the more successful teams know how to create winning cultures even beyond on the ice or on the field. How do you create a winning culture in, in an organization like yours? It's it's super difficult. Um, I think business can take a lot from the sports world, right? Uh, I did come up in the in the corporate world where you had massive staffs. And you and I both know what that's like, right? You. You walk in the office and 25% of the people aren't doing their job. You know, they're there seven hours a day tops and six of that is on Facebook. Uh, you know, we're really looking to push a winning organization by by having the right people in the right roles and then giving them the autonomy to do that. Um, we A couple things we do that are very interesting and are very different from other people is, one, we are not afraid of turnover. Uh, a lot of people view turnover as a negative. We do not. Uh, we, we, in, we encourage turnover. As long as our top people aren't leaving, we want to make sure that we're looking at people that are coming in, that they're fitting. And it's gotten to a point now where our staff has gotten so strong that they'll almost reject a poor performer like a, like a body will reject a bad organ, right? I don't even need to pay attention. I mean, I know right away to say, look, they don't share the appreciation for us. They don't share the work ethic we do. Um, they don't really fit for us. So, you know, and, and then for us, what's different is, you know, we're constantly having that discussion because for us, it's a never ending season, right? We don't have a trade deadline and then the off season right? We're always looking to get better. And, and the, the real reality, the one thing that, that frightens me, what everybody who says, what keeps you up at night, right? What keeps you up at night is businesses that become beholden to a past revenue stream and die. It's happened over and over and over and over again. And so right. what we're looking to do is refresh that staff to make sure that that revenue stream is taken care of, but that we're focusing on what's next. Right. And so some of the things we do, we create a winning organization by mandating 50% of what you do is tied to the future and not to the past. We're always looking for that. We mandate with our customers that they understand that's how we do this. Now, Henry Ford once said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they, they would have said a faster horse, right? We need to be able to step back, take the Steve's job or Steve Jobs approach and say, what's next and how do we do it? And most importantly, if you're not the best, you leave. Uh, we constantly look at our, our staff and you know, there's no surprise to me. It's funny because some people would hear that and they would say, I never want to work in a situation like that. Well, then you probably shouldn't work here, right? Right. The people that are here longer than six months, we have very, very little turnover because they're hard workers who love what we do and we do a great job together. And because of that, we're constantly pushing for more. And, and we expect the same of myself and everybody else. Well, I think that's how you reward the ones that want to build a championship. And it turns out a lot of times the ones that can't or don't want to deselect themselves anyway. They don't. We don't have a salary cap, right? I mean, for us, there's not. You can only have so many max players and max roles. We, we can go get max players in every role, and we can always do better. And that's that's how we do it with our staff, and we approach it that way. We, we bring people in sometimes who maybe are a little below the level, and we tell them, look, we know that. We're going to push you in the game. You're going to throw some interceptions. As long as you come back to the sideline and understand why you did it and how. You don't point fingers. You don't complain. You don't hang your head. Right. You're going to work out here, right? And it's, uh, I'm humbled by the staff we have here. They're fantastic. They make me look good every day, which is not easy to do. So yeah, right. <laughs> well, six foot seven. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, they say the best ROI of somebody that's made a mistake is not to fire them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're always looking to get people that are growing, and, and you know, for us, it's never been a circumstance of somebody like making a mistake and having to go. It's usually the effort that's the issue, right? If you're right. you're a talented person who's working hard and who's dedicated to what we're doing, it's our job to make you succeed. And if, if you're not, that's our problem, right? And that's why we built such a good team here. No, I think it's I think it's brilliant. Um, in in the same respect, you know, we we also do a lot of our executive search firm. We also do a lot of work in board advisory and board search and and the impact board members have on a on a business and the and the CEO and the executives. How do you view the value of board members and, and what the right fit is on a board? You know, um, I'll do a little self-deprecating first in the hope that somebody else will learn from that path. Um, I underestimated dramatically the value of a board when we built one six years ago. I thought, you know, these are a couple of people that are going to come in and vote. We'll see them here and there. I did not understand how much of an asset they can be. And I didn't understand just how important they are. 
and I got real lucky with some of the guys that we found at that point. Um, I think a board is one of the most crucial assets you have in a business. Um, you know, when you're the CEO, they're the guys, they're your boss, first of all, but they're also people that you can actually talk to, right? right? It's, you can't be friends with your staff to a certain level, right? In the end, you are the boss. You have to turn your back on that or on that crowd to lead the orchestra. I think uh, what I would do as far as, you know, how do I do the right thing, right? I think, you know, you need to identify what you want from the board first, and then you need to fill those roles. Because otherwise, you get a lot of startups, and I'm on the advisory board for four of them now, but they just go look for superstars. They, they get, you know, five power forwards who all do the same thing. That team's not going to win, right? right? right. You, need, you need the realist. You need the numbers guy. You need the introductions guy in this industry. You need the we've done this before guy, and you need the we know how to sell this company guy. And I'm so thankful for the guys we have, you know, Claudio Pincus, Rahul Prakash, uh, Edwin Miller, they're all cut from a different mold. They're very different guys. And that creates the correct conversations we need to have. So, you know, I would say don't underestimate your board, you know, make sure that you identify what you want from each person and then fill those roles, regardless of who the superstars are, because you will have superstars that come to you. And don't have any overlap. You don't need two point guards. Yeah, we've, we've found that totally. We're doing a lot of education with our clients about it's not the old days where everybody's from the same industry, everybody's oh. a certain age, every this and that. It's actually exciting because the diversity of, of not just, you know, man, woman, black, white, this, I mean, the diversity of expertise and, and the culture that they bring to the table is fantastic. It, it really is. And, and you will get, I mean, I would encourage you, know, younger CEOs, you'll get to that point with your board where you feel comfortable having that conversation. It's constructive. It's direct. I mean, my staff always ask me what you're like. I said, it's like going to Shark Tank. They say, wow, that sounds awful. I'm like, it's not. Because, you know, as one of my board members tell, told me, uh, Claudio, he said, you know, really smart people sniff out BS pretty quick. And once you throw some BS out there, they don't believe another word you say. And there's nothing better than having those guys on your side first because it prepares you for everything else. You, you better believe it. You better believe right? it. Yeah. Hey, you talked about fraud before. Oh, yeah. A lot of stuff going on with cybersecurity and hacking and everything that goes along with it. Um, how do you see it's it's the impact is on not only your business but other businesses? It's, it's it, you know, there, there's a couple of different things you know. Fraud versus social media. Fraud is we're playing catch up here and it's frightening. You know we like to we like to have a mantra here where we're always trying to you know play offense on our sales side, on our market side, on development, on everything else. I'm saying overall, as a market, as everybody in technology, we're all playing catch up to cybersecurity, right? Uh, there are genius people out there looking for any chink in the armor they can find. And it, it's mandatory for all of us to get to a point where we can, we can defend that armor. And I think everybody has a reasonable expectation with what that comes to. Um, so we have to we have to invest a significant amount of money in that. And the reality is in us signing up customers, that's the majority of our conversation. You know, we get a 100-page document about here's what it takes to do business with Wells Fargo. 95 pages of that is cybersecurity, fraud, and information, right? Yeah. That's just the world we live in, right? And, and I think um, it's interesting. You, you mentioned social media and, and kind of how you manage that and manage your reputation through that. I think that transparency is a great disinfectant. I heard somebody say that years ago, and I really believe that. I think the only people who are afraid of those things you know, backfiring on them are those who are maybe not living you know, a called life that they were supposed to, you know, right. I think, I think as a leader, you really are called to, to be honest, to live the life that you lead in the company and outside of it. And I think if you do those things, you're a little less concerned. The truth is always easier to remember, right? Yeah. And, That's uh, what my parents yeah. always said anyway. It is, you know, I'm not smart enough to remember lies. <laughs> and, um, you know, the reality is on the social media side, we just encourage everybody here. If it's not adding to the conversation. Don't say it. And, uh, I feel a little like you kids get off my lawn when I'm saying that because uh, I, I get eye rolls and whatever. I'll say, you know, my staff comes to me because you're not on Snapchat. And I say, you know what? If you're sending me something that has to disappear in 24 hours, I don't want it. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a great point you make. Um, it's along, along the lines, you know, everything our parents said always seems to come back along the lines. Of, if you have nothing good to say, don't say it. I think what you said was brilliant there where um, if you have nothing to add, you don't just have to say stuff just to say stuff, you know? Right. So, it's the... Uh, is that Mark Twain or is it Hemingway who says, uh, better to let people presume you're an idiot than open your mouth and prove them correct? Absolutely. So that's, why, that's why I try not to talk too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm with you there. Um, yeah. So let me ask you, advice-wise, young up-and-coming leaders, God knows there's, there's plenty of them. Um, yeah. Relation, you were talking about technology, relationships. How important does that impact 
they should or should they consider that as uh, impacting their career and their and their life? It's um, I, you know, I'm a big supporter of mental health. I used to volunteer with uh, Union Rescue Mission for years when I was in college and afterwards. We've had some of those issues before, you know, around our family. I think the problem you run into with founders, a lot of people really underestimate the effect this is going to have on you, on your spouse, and on the people around you in your life. Um, it is a lonely job at the top, and if you're not prepared for it, if you don't have the people around you who have done this before, if you underestimate it, it will fold. Right. And I've seen it happen with too many people. I would just encourage a startup person to, you know, as much as you want to be the guy who works harder or the girl who works harder than everybody else, and that's fair. I like to say that I'm that person, right? You have to have that balance, and you have to lean on the people who've done it before you, right? Sit down, understand that path, understand what you're getting yourself into, uh, both for your relationship and everything else. Have a very clear conversation. Don't make any assumptions that, honey, you know, I've been married since we started this. This is what we're doing. These are our roles, right? And it's going to be bumpy sometimes, but, you know, my wife is the greatest woman in the world to me. And, and we've had those clear de definitions across the board. It's really helped. And one thing I didn't learn until a couple years into it is you need to also have those with your friends. Um, the reality is, and you know, everybody always talks about that analogy of when you go to a store, you can always find the store owner quickly. He's the guy that's out front sweeping the sidewalk, right? <laughs> Not the guy sweeping behind the counter. And, and that's your life. And that's the way it is. And, and the people that love you will understand that if you're honest about it when you start. And listen, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what it's going to mean for us. And this is where we go forward. And, and if I had told that to 27-year-old me when we started this company, I would have rolled my eyes and said that's a bunch of sappy nonsense. Yeah. But um, it's incredibly important moving forward. No, good, good, good advice. Um, so here's some real personal questions, super personal sure. questions. Uh, do you have a pet or any pets? I do. I have a dog, Gula, a nine-year-old Maltese. She's about this big, so she keeps me busy. All right, well, you have to send us a picture because we're doing a uh, series that's going to come up called uh, Pets and Their Executives. Ah, she's the best. She's the best coworker I have. Sits at my feet, and uh, she was here earlier. It's too bad I already took her home. Well, take a picture with you and her and send it into us for the series. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you absolutely. Know, I think I know the answer to this. Do you have a favorite activity or sport? You know what? Um, most people think volleyball because they played it, but I'm a big golfer and surfer. Those are the two things I do the most. Uh, I can get in the water. I find a time. Starting a business has been rough on both of those, but um, I, I do my best to get out whenever I can. Good for you. Got to have some balance. Movie, movie, TV show, any favorites? Uh, I've got a lot of them. I think TV show. Uh, I like Friday Night Lights. Uh, I really like The Wire. Um, I thought those were both fantastic. I think what's on currently, um, I enjoy last week tonight. Uh, I think Silicon Valley is pretty funny because it's, it's really tied to what we're doing. Right. So, uh, And as far as movies go, it's, it's just too many. I, I'm an old school guy, I mean, at least for my generation. I like Fletch and Can't Buy Me Love. So. Well, my kids took me to an outdoor movie of... Uh... Ferris Bueller uh, the other day, so for uh, for Father's Day, that was a classic. <laughs> yeah, it hit its 30 year anniversary, I think. Something. It was 25. Yeah, yeah. No, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I know it's going fast. Do you have a favorite music and food? I just like live music. You know, uh, I, I joke with my kids uh, that work here that you get off my lawn. I'm never going to apologize for what I like, and uh, it's generally not one genre. Uh, I just like what I like, and uh, so I like a lot of it. Jack Johnson, Tom Petty, you know, Fogarty. You know, those kinds of guys. I like some country stuff. I like some, some of the newer stuff. Um, not a big electronic dance guy. I know that's the, that's the new fad. So you like but, uh, uh, Taylor Swift telling Apple what's up? I, I love it. Good for her, nice. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the things I've read about it is that's just the kind of person she's always been. So good for her remaining the, who yeah. she is, it's you awesome. know, with all that fame. I, I can't imagine having that much fame. I just can't. It's incredible. And she's right. pretty cute to boot. Yeah, she does all right. She's a talented songwriter, and it all starts with the fact that she's very talented. So Yeah, in a number of ways. Favorite type of food? Um, I like Mexican food. I like to joke that I um, I have a, uh, a gringo stomach and a Latino palate. So <laughs> I love really spicy food, and I, I eat a lot of it, but uh, it doesn't agree with me much as I get older. Well, and that international flavor, thank you so much for participating. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. We'll see you soon. All right.